Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode. Um, it's finding time for an update on this Commodore Pet. Um, it's been nearly three months now, can you believe it, since the last video. And what a disappointing video it was, in that it didn't power up or do anything at all. Um, I've been um, busy working away at it, at the um, logic side, on the video circuit, trying to find out what's wrong with it. Um, with the help of... Um, and with the help of the um, Vintage Computer Federation Forum, um, I'm pleased to say I'm managing to make some progress. See, I've been recording everything that I've been doing um, in the hope to use some of the footage. I think I ended up with a couple of hours of footage over the last few months. But of course I'm not going to show all of that because it would be a bit boring. So I've kind of edited down to the best bits, um, well hopefully anyway, um, to show you exactly how I, I went about doing things. Exactly, yes. Um, it's not the um, best methods of doing things the way I've done it. It's been quite a learning curve in fact. Um, I've, learned exactly. how to, I've learned how to use an oscilloscope and a logic probe uh, with the help exactly. of some people. Um, so that's good. I'm finally at that stage now. So like I said, this is not really a how-to video. This is just how I've gone about doing things in this video. Um, like I said before, it's been a complete learning curve for me. I've learned so much along the way. I've come so far. Uh, I'm still working on the pet. I'm now working on another part. And I'm in the process of editing that video already. So I'll stop rambling on now and uh, let you see where I've gotten to. Um, this first, the first bit you're about to see, I'm, I did the next day after the um, last video of uh, the initial power up. So let's see where I got to. Shortly after the last video, when I did its first power on, um, I did a few tests straight away to see what was going on on the board, if anything at all. I checked uh, the output of the voltage regulators here to make sure I was getting 5 volts out of them all, and I am. Um, after leaving the computer on soak test for a little bit, pretty much all the chips were getting warm. Uh, they are all generating a bit of heat, nothing was getting um, hot or burning or no smelling or anything like that. Um, but one thing I did notice after a few minutes of its initial power on, um, when I had it on soak test, uh, was some, like a, not a crackling, but like a little bit of a sound coming from the back there. Uh, from that area there. Now one of the ceramic capacitors is broken um, but I'm told that shouldn't make any difference because it's just a, uh, for, fil for filtering. I think it might have been coming from the character ROM. I don't know why I'm saying that. I just sensing it might have been. What I did next was I pulled all the removable chips apart from the RAM and um, I used contact cleaner first. I pulled them all out, cleaned the legs off and popped them back in again uh, to see if that would make any difference just in case it was a bad joint because I'm told that um, these pets, and this, certainly this version, are notorious for bad connections on the ICs there. Uh, but that, like I say, that made no difference. Before I went on any further, I thought I'd best make sure the CRT screen and the CRT board actually worked, and that I bought separately. thought I'll um, pull my PET 3016 out and plug the motherboard into the um, PET uh, 2001 CRT see if you get anything up on the screen sure enough I did as you can see there unfortunately it is upside down uh, that's because I had the yoke in the wrong way around I even get the annoying dot at the end when you switch the computer off the CRT is working perfectly along with the um, CRT board as you can see I've uh, changed out the video RAM there I did that got a couple of um, substitute adapters there so you can use a more modern RAM that's made no difference probably notice I've got this device here. This is um, a device from Tynemouth Software. It's a PET ROM RAM um, substitute. And what this will do is what it says on the tin basically, it will replace your RAM or ROM or both at the same time uh, for test purposes so you can see what's actually wrong with your PET. Uh, quite a neat little device actually. Uh, this came with another PET that I already own which also has RAM issues. So I pulled that out of that PET and popped it into this one. Well, unfortunately I'm still not seeing any difference. Can switch between RAM or ROM, like I say, and also the different basic. Uh, it's got a little test mode built in as well, which is quite handy. But uh, again, I'm seeing no output whatsoever. Uh, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to pull out uh, the two PIA chips and the VIA chip, and all of the RAM apart from these two here. Um, because basically, like modern computers, when you have a problem, you need to basically remove all the um, peripherals to see if any of those are stopping the computer from booting. Um, because I've been told that could be the case with those three chips I just mentioned and possibly the RAM. This RAM is notorious uh, for going bad apparently, it's very static sensitive. 
and uh, the pair only needs these first four rams here to actually boot. So I've recently acquired one of these. Um, it's a chip puller uh, made by Jonah Tools, an EX2, is a model number. Um, it looks like it's made out of metal, but it's not. It's actually just uh, electroplated plastic. Uh, quite an expensive device. I was waiting for one of these off of Amazon for quite a while to come back into stock. I paid £22 for that. And uh, the next day or two, I think it went up to 30 yard. Certainly not worth that, in my opinion. Um, it's a little bit of a fickle thing to use. You have to make sure you get those two locating parts there underneath the chip. Otherwise it misses them when you try and pull them off. I like to just squeeze the side just to make sure they're underneath. that's those out and now it's time to pull out the RAM. Um, I have already tried the computer previously with those three out but now I'm going to pull the RAM out as well see if that makes any difference. Okay, now that's had a chance to dry out a bit, um, I'm going to do a power up. Um, I've got the composite video output at the back there, plugged into this TV. So I've been trying that out as well to see if there's any uh, life, but I've not had anything yet. So uh, let's do a power on now and see if anything happens. Nothing. So I think the next thing to try, which um, some other people already pointed out, which I agree with, is to start looking on this side of the board and start looking at the video output um, to see uh, if there's any activity on that and see if, there's, if the problem lies there. Low output on, just switch pulse off. So low output on video one, video three is high. So video three, video two there is high, then video three or vertical and horizontal. Number says you expect nothing on the earth one there. Well, that could potentially be a problem. What was I thinking? I don't need all the RAM in, do I? Because I've got the um, RAM ROM board there. So let's just remove the rest of these and uh, try that again. Let's see if anything happens this time. I don't think it will, but you never know. It's plugged in. Okay. And nothing. Exactly the same as it was before. Okay, so I've actually removed all the EPROMs now as well um, to see if that would make any difference, just in case there's any shorts, it's made no difference. And I've now removed every single IC, um, even the character set at the back there, just out of curiosity to see if that would make any difference. But it hasn't. So the only thing in there at the moment is the Pet Ram ROM board. I've got it set to test mode, which is number two, and the um, replacement video chips. So we're getting no life whatsoever. So it's time to stop messing about with this side of things now. And like I said before, what I probably should have done to begin with, is start looking at the video output um, and see if there's anything going wrong on that end of things. So I'm going to go off and do some more research now and uh, see what I come up with. Okay, so after doing some research online, I eventually came across a site called Zimmers.net. Uh, this is a site that hosts all the archives for the Commodore Pet series computers from over the years. It has all the circuit diagrams and other information for pretty much all the pets, I believe. Uh, here in front of us, we have the video circuit diagram 
from the Commodore PET 2001 series, the one that we're working on. This shows all the different components used to make up the video circuit, um, the circuit for the video output. Um, on the right hand side there, highlighted in yellow, is um, J7, which is the monitor output cable that goes to the actual monitor itself, to the PCB. Uh, and then highlighted in red, you've got the vertical drive. And then highlighted in green, you've got horizontal. And highlighted in blue, you've got the video uh, output. To make things easier, I've traced these back to the pins of the ICs that they are coming from. From J7, pin 1 video comes from pin 6 of E9. Pin 3 of J7, the vertical drive, comes from pin 11 of D8. And pin 5 horizontal comes from pin 2 of C5. On all the pets after this, I believe, the video circuit was actually contained in just one single chip, uh, which I think, I believe, is a custom chip made by Commodore themselves. I actually prefer the fact this is made up of different components. Um, it allows us to see inside the actual circuit itself, and they pretty much used off-the-shelf components to make up this video circuit. Because it's a lot more fun trying to find out what's wrong with these things. Um, and being able to look at each single chip individually that make up the complete video circuit itself. Um, it's not as much fun just to be able to replace one chip and then it's all done. Although some people may disagree with me on that. Up on the screen next we have a picture of the circuit diagram of the CRT board itself showing the three inputs um, highlighted in uh, blue, red and green. Um, our little uh, pictures uh, drawn on of the waveforms that you're looking for on these inputs. Um, in blue there you've got video in, um, in red there you've got vertical and in green you've got horizontal. And on this slide here um, we have some actual images highlighted in green, red and blue showing what you're looking for on a scope on those pins from J7. Uh, it was at this point I decided to pull my oscilloscope out of mothballs I've never used before. Uh, I, bought, I bought this oscilloscope now, um, probably nearly two years ago off of eBay, hoping to one day use it, and finally I'm going to be given that opportunity. Um, now I didn't realise at the time when I first started doing tests on this, there are two probes available for an oscilloscope, times one and times ten, or at least at least those two, and maybe more. Um, and it turns out that my scope was actually a times ten, which did confuse things slightly through testing. Um, there's also a, a picture here of the settings you need on your scope for each of those inputs provided by Commodore. Obviously we're only looking at the um, first top three there. After messing about with my scope and fumbling about with it, um, even using the settings there from Commodore, those first three settings on that page, I wasn't getting any readings like that whatsoever. Um, it was pretty much flatlined, just getting a little bit of interference. So the next thing to do would be to start looking back at the ICs themselves where the signals are coming from um, to see if um, they're actually doing what they should be doing and outputting what, and outputting what they should be outputting. Um, and I did actually go to college back in 1991 and study electronics. I remember looking at AND gates and NOR gates and things like that, programming EEPROMs, all basic stuff. And it was such a long time ago I really can't remember any of it. Um, obviously for those of you who do know, um, there are truth tables you look at for different gates um, to see what their output should be depending on what their inputs are. Uh, but it was at this point I was starting to get a little bit overwhelmed with it all um, and I didn't really know exactly what I was looking for because obviously you've got to keep tracing your steps back uh, because obviously it's all dependent on what the last chip is outputting to what it inputs to the next chip and so on. It was around about this time when my viewers approached me, uh, I think it was um, sometime in October of 2022 and said um, come and join the Vintage Computer Federation forums, we'll be able to help you a little bit further on there. Um, so I opened um, a post on there and sure enough I've been discussing this with people and they've been extremely helpful. Um, now my knowledge is quite limited and they've been extremely patient with me um, but one of the first um, points they told me to have a look at was C9 uh, on the board so we'll go and have a look at that next. Okay, so ICC9 has finally arrived, uh, which is an SN74LS93N. Um, I'm going to be replacing that shortly. I'm going to put a new socket in, 
uh, once I've removed it and I shall put the replacement chip in but before I do that I just want to run some tests on the scope um, and the logic probe just to show what readings I'm getting now before I change it okay so that's the scope on um, so C9 pin 1 that's the clock that I get just a good sign pin 2 pin 3 pin 4 pin 5 6 pin 7 pin 8 a little bit of a waveform there. At the beginning here, when I first started using the scope, I didn't realise that the probe I was using that came with it was a times 10 probe. Um, so that um, skewed the uh, reading slightly. Pin 9. Um, so obviously now I do have a times 1 probe, so the readings make more sense. Pin 10. Pin 11. Pin 12. Pin 13. And pin 14. So there is a little bit of activity there, but um, it's not the waveforms that we're looking for. Uh, now with the Logic Probe. Pin 1, pin 2, pin 3, pin 4, pin 5, pin 6, Pin seven. Obviously, some of these pins aren't actually connected internally. And there's nothing connected to them externally, uh, but I can't remember exactly what they are off the top of my head. Pin eight. Pin nine. Pin ten. Pin eleven. Pin twelve. Thirteen. And pin 14. Okay, now we have those um, recorded. I shall now remove that IC, socket it, and put the new one in and see what readings we get with that. Okay, so here's the board. I've got it on my silicone um, mat here. Uh, I've got myself earthed up so I don't cause any static damage. Uh, there are a few different ways I could go about removing this IC here on C9. Um, I could use my electric solder station, um, it's from the built on solder sucker, um, but I'm not going to use that because I don't want to end up marking the board or damaging it because I'm quite heavy handed. So I'm just going to do it the old fashioned way and use a manual solder pump after applying some fresh solder to each of the uh, connections. And if I do get stuck, I've got some. Um, braid here that I can use to help uh, mop up any of the um, solder that's still left and we'll see how I can get on with that. Someone did mention about snipping off all the legs um, on the IC there. I've never done that before actually and it's quite a good idea to I suppose because then you can just remove each pin individually but uh, I'd like to keep the IC uh, just in case there is nothing wrong with it just in case my testing has um, gone wrong somewhere along the line because I'm an amateur at this, um, this is the this side of things with logic chips is new to me, so it's certainly a learning curve. Um, I thought I'd record everything I do, so um, if I do make any mistakes, I can I can look back and learn from my lessons, uh, from my mistakes, learn a lesson, and um, somebody maybe has to point out along the way where I went wrong. So I thought it'd be a good idea to document everything. Uh, where's my book gone? I've written down all my findings, all my readings rather. Of, of the IC. Um, there we go. I've written down which um, legs what I, what I got out of them basically so I can look back for a reference point. So I've got that to look at. So I suppose the next thing to do now is to turn it over and uh, start removing it. The good thing about this board is it's um, all labelled up from A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. And it's the same on that side and underneath as well. So straight away I can see it's there, that like C9. There we go, it's that one there. So let's add some fresh solder. Thank you. 
well, I can see daylight through them, but they're still slightly attached just across the edges there. So I've just added some solder to the other side, which has made some of it come back through this side. Obviously that's going to have happened because gravity is going to take over and put it through. Watching this back in editing, I'm kind of cringing now at um, this old method I used to use. Um, because later on down the line now, I just snip the legs and remove them one by one. That way you get no damage whatsoever to the board. So there's still quite a bit of solder on this side. So I'm going to try the braid now. Okay, so I have got, got it out. Um, it's not looking too bad on this side. However, on this side, I did slightly lift the trace just there on pin three. Um, that looks like it will reattach okay. So I shall clean this up and um, pop in that socket now. A bit disappointed in myself for doing that. Unfortunately, it's just one of those things. Sometimes it happens. Like I said, I'm just uh, I'm still learning, so. I do practice on um, old scrap machines now and again. But uh, sometimes things just go wrong. A bit disappointing, but never mind. Just gonna give it a clean with some uh, isopropyl alcohol. Old toothbrush. And once this socket's on, I won't be going back underneath of it again. Always one pin doesn't want to line up. Okay, so I pushed the socket in and a couple of pins popped back up because the hole clearance was just slightly too small off a couple of microns. Um, so I had to suck out a bit more solder again. Popped it back on, still another one did it, but I managed to push it through um, with a flat blade screwdriver, probably not ideal. But now I can solder it on. So I shall do that next. Not my best work, but it's done. I shall just do a quick continuity check now on those pins, just to make sure that they're going through okay. That the solders made contact. Okay, so with the chip now in place, I'm now actually getting something on the screen. There we go. First signs of life for this Commodore pet. So I shall um, start doing some more readings now with the scope and see what I'm getting. Um, one thing to note is um, the yoke is still upside down actually. I haven't adjusted that yet. Because obviously like I showed you at the beginning of the video, I had it around the wrong way. Um, so that's the first thing I need to look at. And also there was a bit of a high pitched sound just now for a moment from the tube. So I quickly turned it off. So I'm not quite sure what that was. But we'll do some more readings now with the scope and see what we find. Unfortunately, after recording that last clip, um, turning the computer off and back on again, I was working by a blank screen. Uh, after reporting my findings to the Miniature Computer Group, uh, somebody suggested looking at C5. So um, I'll be replacing that next. Okay, so I've just removed C5. Um, did a bit of a better job this time compared to the other one I did, the first one I did. I went to use my um, solar station, solar pump there. Came on for about five minutes while it was heating up, then it just cut out. So <laughs> that's another repair to do. I shall clean this up now, put a socket in there, and um, I'll wait for the chip to come and we'll, uh, we'll test it further. Well, I'm pleased to say that after replacing a C5, I'm now back to where I was before. Uh, with a thin horizontal line. That's the problem with these old computers. In repairing one thing, something later on could fail. Hopefully that will be the last failure I have going forward. 
Okay, so next then we're going to be looking at um, D5. One, two, three, four, five, that one there. Um, and that is SN74LS107AN. Um, talking to someone on the computer group, or a few people, they pointed out that it's D5 just there on the schematic. Um, that's a clock, basically, and it's, um, it's not quite acting as it should be. I've been going over the board uh, with a logic tester with their help and they've been telling me where to look so I've been writing down all the uh, results in my book here so I can obviously go back to it for reference points um, quite interesting sometimes the, re the readings do change um, it's quite a strange um, strange situation actually it does seem to be quite intermittent but um, I'm going to change D5 next and the first two chips I took out, I managed to completely desole and keeping them intact. But I did end up lifting a trace on one of the pins, quite disappointingly. Um, someone's pointed out to me that maybe a better way would be to snip the legs off. So I'm going to do that the closer I can get to the top of the uh, IC. And then um, pull the pins out one at a time with a pair of tweezers, just heating it up gently with a soldering iron there. So we'll do that next. Um, one thing I just want to point out actually before I um, go to the next bit is when you look at the schematic that Commodore provided uh, back in 78 I think it was they've got a grid reference going across the bottom here A to J and then it goes obviously um, 1 to 9 that way when you do when you look on here though there's no chip in that area there and they're counting that one there as 1 so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 so D8 in actual fact, that's D8 there, but they've got it laid off to D7 because they've missed out there basically. And the same thing goes for um, the CPU as well. That's actually F2. I think the class is F3, if I remember rightly. So it can be quite confusing if you're not used to looking at these kind of things. It does pain me to do this, but uh, the ball's more important than this um, logic chip. Going as close as I can to the IC, so I've got something to hold on to with the tweezers. There we are, it's released. All the pins removed. Next thing to do, I'll turn it over. I'll add some fresh solder to the socket there and uh, suck out. The old solder. I'm just going to clean up these pads actually first because um, it'll be the last chance I get to do it before the new socket goes in and it does look a little bit grotty. There we go. It's much better. Right. I see in 107AN. Interestingly, when I um, ordered these 107ANs, so SN74LS107ANs, um, the first lot I ordered, the guy sent me just N, not AN, and um, I popped it in because I thought, can there be much of a difference? And the horizontal didn't output anything. But when I told him about it, he sent me the correct ones, uh, which is very good, and obviously it was his fault. When I put the correct one in, it, um, the horizontal came back. Um, I don't know if it's just um, coincidence or it's the horizontal is intermittent still at the moment, but uh, we'll find out. 
These are Motorola, these ones. Can't see it off camera, but I'm just bending the legs in slightly against the table. So that, because uh, it's had to be splayed out with otherwise. Right, next thing to do will be to go and try it then. And plug it all back in and see what happens. Fingers crossed. Okay, the bolt's back in. Let's um, switch it on and see if it's made any difference. Ooh, I've got a bit more now. A bit more vertical. And now I'm seeing blocks on the screen. So that's good then, or something. I'll um, get the probe back out now and start looking around the board at the, um, the vertical signal again, horizontal on the video signal and then uh, I'll look on the scope as well I'm oh, jumping about a bit there, look Well, it's um, certainly doing more than it was before Okay, something that's um, happened while I was um, probing the logic board um, A loud bang came out the back of the CRT monitor here along with a um, cloud of of uh, magic smoke uh, which gave me quite a shock as you can imagine and you can see um, the guts of a capacitor there spread all over the flyback and amongst other, some other components there's actually um, this little one here that went that's the one that blew out um, it's a 10 uf capacitor electrolytic capacitor that was in there and i immediately replaced it with the same one um, but uh, after talking to somebody about it on a vintage computer group they told me, in fact, that's actually still the incorrect capacitor. Um, I just happened to have the original old board here, the one that was damaged, and that's the actual um, capacitor there. That was actually um, been dislodged when it was crushed. Uh, but the capacitor itself looks to be in good condition. Apparently, these um, um, are oil based capacitors, and they're a different characteristic to the electrolytic capacitor. And the reason that blew is because it got too hot, apparently. Um, that ball actually came to me with that capacitor in already. Um, or the one that blew, should I say. The one that blew um, was already in the board that came to me. That was a spare board that I bought. So I'm going to swap that one in now and um, see if it makes any difference to the horizontal and vertical. So we'll try that next and see what happens. Uh, fingers crossed it won't blow up. Like I say, it looks okay. Can't see any physical damage, just slightly been pulled out of the board. Apparently um, it should still be okay after all these years, but uh, we'll see when we uh, try it. Okay, there it is in place. Um, I'm going to swing it round now and turn it on and see what happens. Okay, well here it is back on with that um, old capacitor in from the old board. Uh, I'm pleased to say it didn't go bang, uh, but I can't see any difference whatsoever in the picture. But um, I've been told that uh, this one will last a lot longer than that little tiny thing we had in before. Okay, so we're back, uh, about to replace another IC. Um, just a quick catch up, so far we've replaced um, D5 there, D5 and C5 and C9. After many um, scope readings um, throughout the board, looking at the schematics, uh, following traces back and forth, making sure things are connected correctly, um, We've all come to the conclusion, myself and some other people in the computer group, that um, A1 is going to be uh, the next one to replace. Uh, I've got nothing to lose apart from obviously extracting a, an old chip, um, but uh, we've got to move forward now because we've been on this now for quite a while already. In fact, um, we've been on this now pretty much every day for two weeks. So we're going to go for that one there next, A1, it's a SN74LS93N. So I'm going to do the same methods I did before, I'm going to cut the legs uh, because I found that worked quite well for me. Um, it results in no damage at all to the board. So let's do that next. I'm going to try to do it as close as I can to the IC. So I've got something to work with, all the pins out afterwards. You can actually see dust coming off of those as I snip them. 
corrosion dust. out. I should give that a quick clean now because it'll be the last chance I get to go under there. There we are, we've got our, uh, our new chip there. So we'll put that in in a second to wait for the iron to heat up. It's much easier doing it this way for me at least. I'm just not skilled enough yet to carefully remove ICs in fact without damaging any traces. I actually find this quite satisfying as well. them out. Next thing up now is to uh, clear those holes out of solder. Bending the uh, two end ones over just so it holds it in place, so it doesn't drop back out again. And wait to solder it in. Just want to hold it there long enough so the solder can flow through the little hole there, the buyer, into the other side. Not too long as to damage anything. If I don't say so myself, I've done a pretty good job on that. You'd hardly even notice it had been changed. Satisfaction of plugging in a new IC. Sometimes if the legs don't quite want to go in, just run it along the table slope, bend them all over at the same time inwards slightly, just so that they're all pointing inwards ever so slightly. And there we are. It's in. Question is, will it work? Will it make any difference at all? Let's go and find out. Okay, well there it is all back in place. It's now time to switch it on and see if anything has changed at all. Let's have a look. No. Exactly the same. That's a shame. I guess I'd better go and report back and uh, see what the next course of action is. It was around this time I started looking at the inputs and outputs of D8, which I suspected myself uh, was being faulty um, because I wasn't getting anything out of it. Um, I was getting a reading going in, but nothing coming out. So I exchanged this one for a new um, IC, and unfortunately it had no effect. Things just remained the same. So um, after speaking to people back on the computer forum um, about uh, my latest findings in replacing A1, uh, we've talked about things and uh, we did a test with A1 by bridging a, a couple of pins and uh, came to the conclusion that uh, B1 would be the next one to be looking at. 
Uh, that one seemed to be a bit suspect. Um, so B1 is the next one to be removed and that's what I did. Um, and after successfully replacing it, I finally got a full screen um, for the first time uh, on this pet, which was very nice to see after all these uh, weeks of work. So the next thing to do at this point is to uh, be looking at the video output and finding out what's wrong with that because obviously it's not quite right there as you can see. So there's obviously a problem either with the um, EEPROM character set and or with the video RAM itself. But we'll be saving that for another video. I think this video has gone on long enough now. Um, I hope it's been helpful to somebody out there. Like I said at the beginning, this is not a how-to video. I'm not saying this is the way to do things. This is my way of doing things. It's been a learning curve for me. I've been doing this, learning this, sorry, as I've gone along. Um, thanks to the people on the Vintage Computer Federation Forum. It's been extremely helpful and patient with me. Um, I now know how to uh, basically use an oscilloscope and a logic probe, which is something I didn't know before. And it's quite satisfying when you do actually start using these things and getting some uh, positive results out of it. So I guess that just about brings me to the end of another video. I know this one went on a little bit longer than usual, but uh, I wanted to try and keep as much in as I could. Uh, because I know a lot of people enjoy watching these videos like this. And as I said before, it's a, it's a learning curve and it may aid somebody else in the future. Well, I guess that just leaves me to say, as always, thanks for watching. And until next time, I'll be seeing you. And if you did enjoy watching this video, you may want to take a look at some of my other videos on similar themes. I'm always buying something on eBay, some old piece of technology and trying to repair it. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Thanks for watching.